For most artists today, the use of acrylic gesso is a common practice. But there was a time where artists had to master the use of organic materials in order to preserve their works of art. Welcome to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking about how the old masters used gesso on canvas. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future videos. For those of you that are joining today and joining week after week, welcome once again. Today I have a very exciting presentation and uh, I'm going to be talking about just a series of materials that great artists such as Titian use. I'm going to be talking about linen, just a whole array of wonderful information that you could use in your own works and information that is valuable for anybody that is undertaking the art of painting. So as a, uh, just a general reference, uh, just so you understand what I'm doing here on the channel, remember that this is almost a visual library of traditional techniques. This is something that I, I've been interested in for many, many years. And I'm happy to share the information with a lot of you that are coming by, that are asking your wonderful questions. Remember that during the live presentation, if you have any questions or comments, make sure to share them in the uh, comments below. Uh, they're always welcome. So let's just go ahead and get started with the references. I want to talk about just every week I talk about the references. And this is important for those of you that are joining at home uh, and want to do your own research. This is so important. So a wonderful little book that I always share, uh, Chenino, the Andrea Chenini, just a go-to book that I share. Uh, probably I have shared it <laughs> in every video, but it's because it's such a wonderful book with such an amazing library of knowledge that it's just, you know, probably the most amazing book, the most complete. Uh, so I'm always happy to share this. Now, remember that you could get this book uh, if you haven't checked out my uh, uh, list of books in my kit, in the description below, you could find a whole array of books that you could check out and explore. Some of them you could download for free in archive.org, and some others you, you, know, you have to purchase through the links if you're interested. So, um, yeah, so, and then another wonderful little book that I have got years ago during my travels in Italy, La Pittura Italiana, just an amazing book that uh, I use for historical references, specifically of, you know, just a, a survey of amazing Italian artists from the Renaissance to the 19th century. So just another wonderful book. I don't believe this one is in the listing, but I'll try to get a link for it. So, and then two more publications that I'm going to be uh, referencing today is the National Gallery Technical Bulletin, volume number four. You could find that in the list below in the description. I have a link, a direct link to the PDF from the uh, National Gallery's Technical Bulletin website. And then the National Gallery Technical Bulletin number 36. These are both uh, publications that are dedicated to uh, the techniques of Titian in particular. And he was an artist that was using gesso or natural gesso in, in mo for most of his life. So I'm going to be referencing a lot of his techniques and his use of gesso. So let's just go ahead and get started. Now, I believe that I have some visitors, and I just want to say hello to uh, Methad. Methad, again, welcome to the channel. Thank you for your wonderful questions. Um, so let's see. Uh, I have a question uh, to begin with. I have Williamsburg Flake White. Can I mix it with linseed oil for cooking heat body oil? Um, yeah, I imagine that you could use uh, Williamsburg Flake White. Um, now, remember that the Flake White that you buy in the store, uh, I, I'd rather use the powder form. And these, these uh, pigments perhaps are not, will not be as reactive as uh, or even the paint will not be as reactive as uh, just a dry pigment. Red lead is better and lethargic will, you know, will give you a stronger reaction. Uh, they're stronger dryers. So, but if you just mix it with uh, linseed oil and put it in the sun, that will really uh, yield a very nice oil. So, um, you know, just, you could try that. And I have another comment here. It says, I like stand oil. Uh, 
uh, handling properties, but layer dry is too sticky. I think I have to try your heat bodied oil recipe. Yeah, so this the stain oil is an overall great oil to use, um, but it does dry sticky. And if you put it in the sun with some dryer, specifically red lead or litharge, these are powerful dryers that you will really uh, want to use because um, if not, you're gonna, you, it's hard to layer. You could also thin it down with some solvent uh, such as spike oil or turpentine. Uh, if you're for bottom layers, you just want to use just a tiny bit of oil um, and more solvent. And as you go up in layers, you want to use uh, more oil and less solvent. So, uh, but yeah, the dryer liquids also, if you're interested in the modern dryers, liquids also a very good dryer. I've used it. And when I was in my, uh, my art school years, I used liquid extensively and I, I like liquid a lot. So, um, you know, just, you could explore just, uh, you could make a card, you know, uh, or a notebook detailing your observations. That's what I've done for years. And I, I covet those notes uh, highly because, you know, it gives me a reference to what works and what does not. So, all right, well, thank you for your questions and thank you for your visit. So let's just go ahead and uh, get started with uh, just a basic question. What is gesso? Uh, I, today, uh, and I wanna make a reference to this wonderful material that we all have today, Liquitex Professional Gesso is wonderful. Um, a lot of you are probably even asking, well, why use anything else, right? Well, there was a time where artists did not have a commercial product uh, and they had to create their own surfaces. They had to master the materials that they had available. And uh, today, most artists just don't even think about this. They just buy the Liquitex or the any other gesso. Golden's another great brand. Uh, they just apply it with a brush and off we go, right? Sometimes you could put two or three coats of this wonderful material. But what exactly is in this Liquitex gesso? Well. Uh, I don't have the exact formula of the manufacturer, but I am sure that it has a polymer, okay, such as, uh, such as this one. This is transparent. It's called clear gesso. This is nothing more than perhaps a polymer, okay, base, and uh, mixed with uh, a titanium white or calcium carbonate. They make sort of a hybrid gesso that is somewhat a traditional material, but also with the modern plastic material. And this is very flexible. It results in a great uh, material that you could sand and it's very durable. But for most artists during the Renaissance, they didn't have access obviously to commercial materials. So they had to use, and I believe I have a, let's see, a uh, question here. Um, Mastery, thank you for coming by today. It says, hello, Luis, hope you're well. I use I usually use calcium carbonate plus water plus PVA in ratio, which you say would be better to use rabbit skin glue instead of PVA. Again, thank you for, for a great live topic. So yeah, so Mastery, thank you for your wonderful question. Yes, your formula is very good. That seems to be a, a wonderful formula. Uh, it's a universal formula that even manufacturers like Liquitex are probably using. There's a variation of uh, a PVA is essentially a polymer, okay? Uh, now, is rabbit skin glue superior? So let's just bring out uh, a little bit of rabbit skin glue here. So this is rabbit skin glue. Uh, this is the dry form of rabbit skin glue. And when you soak the rabbit skin glue, let me move some things around here so I don't damage my books, okay? So this is rabbit skin glue that has been, let's just put this book to the side. So, when you take your rabbit's dry rabbit skin glue, okay, you, you have to let it soak. Now, if it's in powder form, you won't have to do that. But in this granules, you have to let it soak for at least 24 hours and uh, the rabbit skin glue swells. Now, this is a material that is susceptible to absorbing moisture. So is it superior to a polymer? Well, it depends. The polymer is not reversible where the rabbit skin glue is reversible. So that means that you could, after hundreds of years, the rabbit skin glue could be, you know, activated with water and essentially, uh, you know, they, they could 
be a restoration, uh, a procedure of restoration on the painting. Whereas the polymer, you cannot do that. It's not reversible. So um, I, for one, uh, I'm a big believer in reversible materials and organic materials. But I, have, I do have paintings that I have used uh, the uh, acrylic gesso, and it works wonderful. So it's up to you. Uh, now, the acry acrylic gesso, you can roll on a canvas. So if, if you apply it on a canvas, you could roll it with ease. So you don't, there's not a danger of cracking, such as the traditional gesso that I'm going to show you. So it's up to you. Um, you know, it depends what you're looking for. If you're wanting to transport your paintings or ship your paintings abroad, or um, you know, you have a lot of exhibitions abroad, and you ha you cannot afford to uh, you know to uh, create the paintings. So this, I I highly recommend the acrylic gesso, but. Uh, Titian and a lot of the old masters uh, use ingenious ways to uh, to make this gesso more flexible, and that's what I, I want to talk about today. Because most artists have the notion that this material is unacceptable on a canvas, and a lot of restorers have you know sort of decried this material as uh, unserviceable. So, but that's not the case when you look at a lot of old master paintings specifically. Venetian painting. So let's just take a look at what happened during the 16th century with Venetian artists and how this development came about. So I want to begin by just a brief history. So for those of you that are not familiar with Titian, one of the greatest artists that ever lived during the Renaissance, uh, he is a pioneer of canvas painting. And this is a wonderful painting uh, that is, uh, I believe, in a uh, and a wonderful exhibition right now at the National Gallery in London, um, and also in the Prado. I think the exhibition traveled, so uh, make sure to check those web websites out. They have some beautiful images. So this painting has a, a gesso support, and it's documented, well documented in the National Gallery Technical Bulletins number 36 and number 34, and you could read those. I believe it's page 11. They have a, a some beautiful uh, radiographs and a nice uh, breakdown of the actual technique that Titian used. And I'm making reference to that. Fortunately, I can't share that uh, information here, but you could go to their, to their website and read that information. That's the information that I'm going to be uh, talking about. So, um, so there is a, a documentation in, in the National Gallery Technical Bulletin that they find uh, calcium sulfate dehydrate. And what is calcium sulfate dehydrate? That's the raw form of gypsum. And gypsum is essentially a mineral. It comes from uh, just outside of Venice. The, uh, there's a, uh, a range of mountains. And uh, they're rich in dolomite deposits. And uh, that's mostly where uh, artists from Titian's era would have been getting their gypsum. Now, they find two varieties, and that's what I want to focus on today. There's two varieties, and when I say gesso, the word is, uh, this is, you know, the, the word gesso means plaster, okay, it's in Italian, and the, the implication has different meanings, meaning that uh, you could use calcium carbonate, okay, and they have found cal calcium carbonate in some of Titian's paintings, they find calcium sulfate dehydrate, and the third material that they find is anhydrous calcium sulfate. And what are the differences? Well, so the calcium sulfate dehydrate is the raw form of gypsum. So essentially, it's just the mineral crushed and mixed with the rabbit skin glue, and that is the gesso. And he indeed used that material. But there's instructions here in the Craftsman's Handbook to use the other material that is the anhydrous calcium sulfate, which is gypsum that has been roasted to temperatures above 480 degrees. Okay, and what happens is that there's a chemical change, and this uh, gypsum is put in water or slate, and it returns to the dehydrate state. And that's the gesso that I'm going to be focusing on because it's the most rare. 
The other forms is essentially just taking raw gypsum, mixing it with rabbit skin glue. Uh, you could even, even grind the gesso, okay, on a, on a porphyry stone or calcium carbonate, uh, chalk essentially. And Titian uses all three varieties uh, in different paintings. Uh, you could log on to the National Gallery and there you could explore a whole survey of, of which paintings they find, you know, the different materials. So, um, but I want to focus on the instructions of Sanino Sanini because today you could buy gesso in most art stores, you could buy the commercial uh, acrylic gesso, you could even buy a traditional gesso that Gamblin makes that is already made. Um, I'm not aware of what materials they put on some of these gessos, but I do know that they usually include uh, titanium dioxide, and that material did not, uh, did not exist during the time of Titian, so that's important to remember. And this type of gesso with titanium dioxide results in sort of a, um, I, I believe that the, the color is just too sterile versus the natural gesso that has a richer, more uh, organic color, so much, sort of like a bone white. So uh, Alexander, I have a question from Alexander. Uh, Alexander, thank you for coming by today. Puedo uh, usar gelatina sin sabor? Can I use uh, flavorless gelatin? Um, Yes, you could. Uh, it depends on the grade. There is a gelatin that I've gotten in the supermarket and also the strength. So this is so important and I'm going to be talking about these factors uh, because it's not just mixing calcium carbonate with gelatin or rabbit skin glue. It's important to uh, assess the strength of the glue. That is really the key. Otherwise, you will have gesso that will you know, the, the, the oil will soak through and you will not be able to seal it. So all these factors, uh, you know, are very important. So let's just take a look at uh, the instructions. Thank you for your questions, Alexander. It's really wonderful that you're here and I appreciate your question very much. So let's just go ahead and um, just take a look at uh, Senino Senini's instructions on how to gesso an Encona with gesso sotil or sotile. Um, so this is really telling because the instructions for uh, using this material that is the anhydrous calcium sulfate. How do we know that um, the old masters were using anhydrous calcium sulfate? Well, it's do documented in the chemical analysis by the National Gallery and also there's a reference here um, of the practice by Sanino Sanini. Uh, so it says here, when you have done the gessoing with gesso grosso and scrape it nice and smooth, and this is for a uh, panel. He also has instructions on how to use uh, the material on canvas, but these are the specific instructions to, for the gesso sotile. So um, it says here, when you have done the gessoing with gesso grosso and scrape it nice and smooth and even it up well and carefully take some of this gesso sotile Put it loaf by loaf into a wash basin of clear water. Let it soak up as much water as it will. Then put it on the porphyry slab a little at a time without putting any more water in, in with it. Grind it very thoroughly. So there you see that he's taking the dry material and slaking it. Slaking is nothing more than putting the material and rehydrating it essentially. So it soaks up the water. Why did the old masters do this? Well, they did this because it results in a finer crystalline structure, okay? And it results in a very, very smooth material, very, it's, it's almost like a, uh, like a silk uh, or porcelain. So um, I, that's the, the process that you're going to see today that I recreated in the video that I'm gonna be showing you guys. It's important to realize that because um, you could essentially buy gypsum from any uh, retailer and just mix it with rabbit skin glue, okay? You could just mix it with this, rabbit skin glue, and, you know, uh, make your gesso. And why would you go through the whole trouble of putting it, you know, slaking it and all that? Well, it's because you will get a finer material, okay? You won't have to do as much grinding as you'll see. Um, so, and remember that the gesso is essentially a mineral that is just 
taken from the earth. And imagine grinding this for hours and hours and hours, you know, through uh, with, you know, by hand or by pounding it. So what they did was by baking it or roasting it, they, you know, they were breaking down the material and by slaking it, there was a further uh, change in crystal structure. So that's really the reason that the old masters were uh, using this material in particular. So um, that's, and that's uh, important to, to realize. Now I have used, and let me just share with you another material that is just wonderful. Uh, if you're not, if you cannot find the hydrous calcium sulfate, I have used the chalk from Champagne. This is a wonderful chalk. It's a very, very fine crystalline chalk that comes from the region of Champagne, France. And this is also a common material used by uh, Titian, and uh, perhaps not as often, but um, you know, there there is some paintings that he uses chalk instead of the um, you know the the gypsum uh, or the slate gypsum. So. This is also common in Flemish paintings, which I've talked about before. And this results in a beautiful, beautiful gesso uh, or chalk and glue. And I just want to show you some uh, pre surfaces that I have prepared before. Okay, This is a beautiful panel. And this techniques came from uh, the culture of panel painting. Uh, this is essentially a piece of wood with eight coats of chalk and glue. And this is almost like a porcelain. I haven't even scraped this surface and it's just so smooth. Um, it doesn't have a very, very uh, strong absorbency. That's one of the reasons that I use this material. And you can use this material on canvas as well, as long as the strength of your glue is correct. Now, what, what is the strength of the glue? What do I mean by that? Well. This is such an important factor because if you, if the strength of the glue, meaning this glue in particular is from Kramer pigments, and you can see that it's not powdered. A lot of manufacturers sell powdered glue, meaning that you'll take this and grind it on a, you know, on a, uh, uh, on a porphyry stone or um, by any, any other means and create a powder. And by putting the right amount of water, you get different strengths. So I can't tell you the exact strength of every batch because you do have to learn to test this. And the way to test it is uh, you want, in order to make a good gesso, you need glue at half strength. If you make it too watery, then the, the gesso is just too absorbent and your pigments essentially will sink in and you will not be able to paint on it. So let me just show you uh, once you have this surface, okay, fully prepared, then you have to seal it with an imprimatura. And this is the, the main purpose of an imprimatura. And in the old days, the age of Titian, they sealed the canvas with an imprimatura as well. In the case of Titian, you, you use a very, very light imprimatura like this one, okay? But not all painters use this technique. Some painters use white lead and seal the gesso with white lead and oil. Now you need to use, you know, a, a paint that is very, very oily. So you have surplus oil that will soak into the, will essentially seal this chalk surface. Now, if you didn't make the gesso correctly, the uh, gesso will get discolored. Okay and it will become sort of a brownish color and you'll see right through it. So that means that the gesso is just too weak. I have seen in some websites that they use varnish, okay? And they seal the gesso with the varnish and all these uh, other, other things, you know? And uh, the best practice is just to get the, the strength of the glue just right. How do you get the strength of the glue just right? Well, there's no way of knowing. It's essentially just testing it out, creating little batches, uh, and or swatches of, of gesso and just you know creating figuring out what the weak strength of the gesso is for most commercial uh, gesso, uh, excuse me for most commercial glues it's usually about 15 to 20 parts water to one part glue so but that that changes from manufacturer to manufacturer there's also rabbit skin glue and hide glue 
So I have another question here. Alex, thank you for joining today. Uh, let's see, could a coat of rabbit skin glue on top of a two absorbent true gesso reduce its absorbency? Any downsides? So um, you could seal the gesso as well with rabbit skin glue. That's a practice that is well documented by Semino Semini and uh, many other uh, treatises. Um, it doesn't seem that a Titian was doing that, but perhaps earlier Netherlandish, Netherlandish painters or even you know, early Italian painters were indeed, you could just apply the gesso. You know, let's just take a look at the raw gesso here. So here's a, a raw gesso, okay? And you will have to scrape this smooth. Uh, today, most artists sand it, you know, uh, you could sand it, I, but you'll get scratch marks. So that's why it was scraped, okay? The scraping with a very, very sharp knife does not leave any marks. And right after this procedure, you could seal it with your very, very weak rabbit skin glue, okay? And then put the oil on top, the oil paint or whatever other medium you're using, right? So um, you could also seal it with uh, egg, okay? Uh, you could essentially take egg white and just seal it, okay? Now, that, this practice is perhaps earlier for painters from the Quattrocento. Uh, in Titian's paintings, they find on canvas, specifically, they find oil. And it's because it makes sense, you know, you're introducing more glue, and the glue could, can activate the gesso that you already apply. So you don't want to, you know, uh, put too much rabbit skin glue or seal it with too much rabbit skin glue because it could quite literally activate the gesso. Remember that it's water soluble. It will always be water soluble, the gesso. So that's by putting the oil, you sort of, uh, you know, make it waterproof. All right. So um, if you did not make the, the surface correctly, as you can see here, the gesso is colored, but not discolored. Okay. That's really important. And that's the same procedure that you would use on a canvas. So um, this, these are important factors. I have seen a lot of blogs where, you know, uh, artists are, are frustrated because they can't seal the gesso. They can't figure out how to do it. And the reason is because the glue, the strength of the glue is not right. So if you use the right strength of the glue, you know, you will, you will not get soaking. So that's really important. Also scraping the, the gesso creates an even surface and for some reason it doesn't soak through as much. So um, yeah, so these are important factors. So let's just go ahead and take a look at uh, the video that I put together for you guys. Now before I, I set up about uh, showing you this video, um, big difference between you know this panel and uh, you know canvas. Okay, during the 16th century, okay, artists began to use linen supports. They used twill, uh, twill weave or a plain weave. This is a plain weave uh, linen, very rough linen canvas. Okay, and this is just a wonderful material. This created a revolution in painting. Okay, artists began dragging the paint and taking advantage of the weave of the canvas. So by dragging the brush on the side, the paint texture would break and you get this beautiful sort of uh, uh, atmospheric effects. And that's what Titian is mostly known for. Him and other and another uh, uh, group of painters such as Veronese, Tintoretto, and also El Greco. El Greco was uh, uh, an artist that uh, travel extensively in Italy and he adapted the techniques of the Venetians later on uh, lived in Spain and died in Spain so uh, but I love his technique and his paintings are in really good condition uh, uh, you know considering that he used a lot of these sort of antiquated techniques let's just remember that artists like Caravaggio and Velasquez were no longer using gesso on canvas they switched to uh, you know just basically a paste of oil paint applied over uh, its size uh, linen you know, canvas. So, um, but there's a lot of debate whether this uh, practice sort of uh, 
contributed to the demise of oil painting. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's debatable today. Um, I, I've seen paintings by Caravaggio that are in wonderful condition, and there's others, such as his paintings of Malta, that are in horrible conditions. He used burnt umber on the surface, which is a you know, pigment that is not very stable. For the bottom layers, it soaks up too much oil, becomes brittle. So um, whether you're using gesso, whether you're using uh, you know, uh, earth pigments, you have to be aware of you know, how each material is going to react. And that's part of what I'm doing here in the channel is creating a literacy for artists to sort of learn these materials and to learn the techniques, right? So, all right, so let's just go ahead and take a look at the video that I have uh, prepared for you guys. This is a recreation of uh, Senino Senini's technique that I, uh, that I have read you. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna narrate as you're seeing the video. So here you will see, let's just go ahead and begin that video. So here's the slate gypsum. Okay, let's see. Here's the slate gypsum. Okay, uh, and I have slaked this for about two years, uh, and it makes it finer in texture if you leave it, you know, for a longer time. I put it on my on my porphyry slab, and there I'm following Senino Senini instructions of just grinding it down. Just look how beautiful. Uh, the material is very translucent. It, there was some particles that were sort of grainy, but not, not many. I mean, it was, I grind this down fairly quickly. From there, there's instructions on how to take the water out of it, and you use just a, a, a white linen rag or cotton rag, and you have to just squeeze the water out of it because you don't want that water affecting the proportion uh, of your glue size. So it's just a matter of just putting it there and just squeezing the water out of it and then just collecting it back into a cup until you have done, uh, you have finished the entire batch. So um, it's a fairly neat operation. I had never uh, done it this way. I have always used, um, you know, just the strainer. Uh, so it's a wonderful method, and I really enjoy doing it. So there, I'm uh, preparing the glue to the right consistency. Uh, in this case, it's half strength. And remember to use discretion when doing this. Uh, make sure to test out the glue. I let it soak for 24 hours. Really important. Otherwise, you could get cracking. Uh, so make sure that you, know, you let that glue soak. Here, I'm using a double boiler meaning water in one vessel and then the other vessel inside. And there I begin with very low heat, testing the heat with my hand and the strength as well. So after I've dissolved the glue fully, I will now mix the glue and the, uh, the gypsum paste into a cohesive uh, mixture by using my hands, just as described by Senino Senini, okay? And by using your hands, you can feel the gesso, you can feel if there's any graininess. If there is, then you have to uh, you know, account for that. So here I've stretched the canvas, it's a linen canvas. I've pumiced the canvas, and now I've shared this video before here. It's the same procedure as uh, any other uh, canvas that we've sized before, okay? Uh, the strength of the glue doesn't have to be the same. You could use a weaker glue for the canvas, um, so, and again, use your discretion. Uh, the canvas has to be flexible, and there I'm applying it in a very almost watery state with a bristle brush. You could do this with a palette knife, and Senino Senini does describe using the use of a palette knife, but I have used it, I have done the palette knife before, and it creates a layer that is too thick. I find it too thick, so I uh, use the method described by some, some Spanish authors of using just a bristle brush, two layers back to back, meaning it's essentially one layer, uh, very watery, and this will dry perfect. It's not thick, and you can see the weave of the canvas, very, very beautiful surface. Um, and you see that it's very translucent. It's not perfect white 
but it will dry very, very white because of those two layers, the, the crystals are creating sort of a, you know, a nice uh, reflection of light. I'm, of course, using a pumice stone to get rid of all the roughness. And here I'm using uh, a red uh, raw sienna pigment, and there's a bonus. You get to see how raw sienna is transformed into burnt sienna. Uh, and this is, I'm recreating a surface from El Greco's painting, and I suspect that he used a pigment similar to burnt sienna. Um, I'm mixing here the burnt sienna with the linseed oil, okay, into a nice paste. Now, I'm not mulling this paste because it's essentially for an imprimatura just to seal the surface. And there you see a gorgeous surface. Uh, this has just the right amount of absorbency, and it just gave me just that beautiful brownish tone that you could see there in the, around the, the halo uh, of El Greco. So um, wonderful techniques, just an amazing process, and I want to show you what resulted. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful canvas, and it has a lot of luminosity, this canvas. So um, you can see that maybe we could get a, a, a closer look at the weave. And this is what I enjoy about this technique. You could see the weave of the linen, and it just has this wonderful luminosity. The camera cannot do it justice. Let me see if I can back this up a little bit. Uh, so. Um, this is really nice. And when you're painting over this, you could get that nice luminosity from the inside. And um, it's, it's just, you know, it seems like a very flexible canvas. Now, uh, I think I have a question here from Pharrell. Pharrell, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate the visit. Uh, it says here, there were times after I had prepared my own gesso and sanded the canvas, my colors would mix with a white residue and appear chalky. Any thoughts on how to avoid that? Please, thank you. Yes, so that is common, Pharrell. Uh, the strength, that means that the glue, uh, and the, the calcium carbonate was not fully bound. Um, and that's why you have to thoroughly mix it with the hand, okay? And if your glue is not uh, prepared in the, to the right strength, it will not bind. It will just be essentially, you know, it's like taking chalk, mixing it with water, and just applying it on a canvas. It will, the, the paint will just go right through it. So the right strength of the glue. Now, I want to go back to, let me just go back to Sanino Sanino. For a lot of you that are made gesso, and making gesso is a delicate operation. Not everyone uh, could do it right. Uh, and, you know, there's, I've seen disasters. I've, you know, I, when I started making or adapting this technique, and I have done commissions on gesso canvas, uh, natural gesso canvas that are in perfect condition to this day, and I, I did these commissions 10, uh, 15 years ago. Um, I, I had a teacher who taught me how to, uh, you know, get the right strength of the glue. Uh, my introduction to rabbit skin glue was, was that, essentially. Uh, you cannot use this material without knowing it intimately, you know. So um, if you don't, don't uh, figure out the, the strength of your glue, you will run into a lot of problems. So you will have to test out, you know, uh, your glue. And I can't tell you the specific strength for each glue because there's, you know, cowhide glue, there's rabbit skin glue. Um, Gambling makes a different glue. Uh, Utrecht used to make a different glue. So there's, there's a whole array, and it changes with each glue. So um, you, you have to take the glue, cook it to full strength, or excuse me, to the weakest strength, determine what the weak strength is, meaning that, so if, you, if your manufacturer says, well, for canvas, it's about 20 parts water to one part glue, then it's a, your half strength is 10, 10 parts water, right? And then you have to make the glue to, with 10 parts water and mix it with your calcium carbonate and create a swatch. And then apply your pigments to see if they will soak through. If they soak through, the, the glue is just too weak. 
So if you have anything coming off your surface, and even pigments, that means that there's no binder or the binder is just absorbing everything. So um, that's very important. You cannot paint on a, a uh, you know, a, a natural gesso surface without sealing it. Just can't. I mean, you could, you could in the first layers just apply, you know, uh, start painting, but you will get dust on the surface. So you have to paint another surface and another surface, uh, excuse me, another layer, another layer until it's it's sealed, and then you'll be able to, you know, to work on it. But uh, to to avoid this, the old masters use an imprimatura. Okay. So that's the, the, the purpose of an imprimatura, and this is a standard practice, and you have to do the same on a canvas, okay? The canvas is, is even more porous. You don't want thick gesso on the canvas, otherwise it will crack, okay? So very, very important. Um, and, you know, the, the, the instructions here that Senino Senini has, and I want to read you these instructions on, uh, let's see here. So... It says here, now let us speak about how to work on cloth, that is on linen or silk, and you, you, will get, you will adopt this method for cloth. In the first place, stretch it out, taut on a frame, and begin by nailing down the lines of the seams. Now then go around and around with tacks to get it stretched out evenly and systematically so that all has every thread perfectly arranged. When you have done this, Take gesso sotil, just as we have shown you, and a little starch. So the little starch, so I have never used the starch, but they do find it in National Gallery Technical Bulletin in Titian's paintings in the ground. And the starch or sugar, he adds here, little starch or sugar, and grind these things with, with the kind of size with which you temper the gesso on panel. Grind them good and fine. So the starch is to create flexibility. Now, there's a lot of techniques where uh, artists are using emulsions and they're putting oil into the gesso to make it more flexible. Certainly, these are techniques that have been explored and they are, have been used by a lot of artists. But in particular, for the artists that I'm focusing on, they do not find emulsion grounds in Titian or uh, El Greco. Um, I'm going to share another article from El Prado that has a survey of 17th century Spanish artists that includes El Greco. And it's, it's just wonderful because it has, you know, um, many different artists and the different uh, primings that they use. So um, there is artists, there. I'm sure that there's a lot of artists that use the emulsion, half, half chalk, half oil grounds and you could certainly experiment with those, but that is not. This is not the case. This is not what I'm talking about here. Uh, I have in the future a, a, a whole uh, live presentation dedicated to emulsions. Uh, I believe Alex, one of the guests here, uh, asked a few questions about emulsions, and I want to address those questions in the near future. Uh, but for now, I'm just focusing on just a straightforward traditional gesso ground is what is described here by Sanino Sanini. So the starch and the sugar are essentially to create more of a flexible ground, but I find that by just keeping it very, very watery, okay, and just applying perhaps two or three layers, no more than that, uh, and, you know, you get a very sort of, I'm not saying extremely flexible, please do not quote me on that, uh, never as flexible as this modern uh, gesso, but certainly uh, a material that is, you know, will stand the test of time, as some of Titian's paintings have done. So, um, yeah, so a lot of information, um, a lot of, you know, uh, wonderful information in the in the manuscripts, and I invite everyone to check out my uh, kit. Uh, it, it has a great library of books that I have used and I always use to. Uh, to sort of uh, um, research a lot of these old techniques. And uh, for a lot of you that are just coming by and are just beginning to paint, are beginning to explore some of these materials, uh, you know, do the research, experiment, uh, take notes. Uh, this will 
uh, help you uh, sort of get you know uh, a nice uh, base of knowledge of what materials work and what other materials do not. So, so I hope that you have enjoyed uh, this presentation. Um, and uh, I just want to tell you very quickly about uh, my uh, classes on Udemy. Uh, these are courses that are designed to help you improve your drawing skills. I'm about to launch a painting course on Rembrandt that I've shared here before, but with more detailed information and other uh, demos included in the video. So make sure to check those links in the description below. And for those of you that are joining week after week and that are asking amazing questions and that are supporting the channel, I want to thank you. And, you know, do come back in the future. And yes, uh, if you have any suggestions for future videos, I'm open to suggestions. We have a lot of information to cover. We have a great community of artists here that are joining week after week. So I want to thank everyone for coming by, supporting the channel. So we'll see you in two weeks' time uh, with hopefully more technical information and more mysteries about old master techniques. Have a good one. Enjoy yourselves.